This week on Brew Bloods, we're finally reviewing a beer from one of our favorite brewers, Petacolis Brewing Company. And the news hits close to home since Miller Coors has bought a majority stake in Revolver Brewing out of Granberry, and we discuss the impact of that sale. So settle up, beer buddies. This is Brew Bloods. Drink beer. Think beer. You're listening to Brew Bloods. There is more to life than beer alone, but beer makes those other things even better. That from beer writer Stephen Morris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's totally correct. Welcome to episode 64 of Brew Blood. We are back, unfortunately or fortunately, we are back on the mainland and wallowing in the onion crotch heat of a Texas August. It's not as bad as it could be now. No, we had a, we have, we had a little bout of rain here in the last 24 hours, so it's a little bit cooler. We're only at like 95. Yeah, it's supposed to get down to like the 80s. That, that, that's Ooh. nice for Texas. Might need to throw in a parka. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's about as cool as it was in Kauai, so you're getting your Kauai weather without the ocean yeah, or the scenery. But for some ephemeral reason, it's so much worse here. Maybe because I'm not living in paradise. That's just because you hate it here. Maybe because I'm not running down the beach slowly in my onesie, rescuing children. Yeah, it's a very uh, red hot chili peppers of you. With so just it, this very slow motion with your man boobs bouncing. <laughs> that's right. Just like Pam Anderson. Very Anthony Kiedis of you. Way less sexy, though. Yeah. Well, you know. I'm like Anthony Kiedis in a Pam Anderson uh, onesie. But the weird thing is you also run with your hands just cupping over your nipples. It's right. really weird. Well, it's not even hands. It's just two fingers on each True. nip. And you're not really being filmed in slow-mo. You just run slow-mo yeah. when everyone else is like normal. And they're like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? <laughs> well, let me be the first to welcome you back to the mainland. Welcome back to pro- the uh, upper 49. I don't think you can do that. You're an islander. I'm Well, I'm here, though, and I was here first. I set... Uh, foot on the ground first, so let me welcome you back. I don't think that's true. I think it is. We had a seat further ahead than you, and uh, we actually got off of the plane first. Well, let me be the first one to welcome you back to the mainland. <laughs> welcome to Texas, Mark. I ripped that lay right off your neck that you wore 24 hours a day while we were in Hawaii. Yeah, it was getting pretty rotten by the end. So, question. Would you rather live in a, a paradise, like Hawaii, with limited access to craft beer as we had, or would you rather live here in Texas with the ample craft beer scene that we have? Uh, I'd rather just know someone in Texas that can send me something to paradise. That would be the ideal. But uh, let's see. really, I think I'd probably be okay with a limited access to craft beer if their limited access has some pretty good stuff, which overall we did find a couple that would be serviceable. So I could probably deal with that. But you don't have any friends to send you anything, so you're going to be stuck with the very limited supply because you don't have that's any true. friends. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I guess I'd probably go with the limited amount and still be in a better place. I think I would have to agree. But I will take full advantage of the good things that we do have here, since we are here right now. May as well make the best of it. Yeah, and that's about all that one can do. Yep, so exactly. Let's also, uh, we should also know, tell everyone that today is uh, National Bad Poetry Day. Is it? Do you yes, have one prepped? I do, I do. Uh, as I, this is from uh, PoetrySoup.com. This is their best of bad poems that they've collected. Oh, okay. Big poo, small poo, yellow poo, blue poo. There are so many different kinds of poo. It's amazing to see what passes through. Square poo, round poo, skinny poo, fat poo. Making poo poo is something everyone has to do. Yes, it's true. I do too. Look at this poo all covered in nuts. It stinks far worse than rotten fish guts. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my. It stinks so bad it caused that fly to die. So some poo is quite smelly, some poo looks like jelly, some poo is very icky, especially when it comes out sticky. Some poo smells high, some poo smells low, some poo slides out fast, and some poo comes out slow. Big poo, small poo, yellow poo, blue poo, what kind of poo is your favorite to do? That's enough. There's like 50,000 other lines of that poem. The interns like it. They enjoyed that. Yes. I know you're paying them, and you're paying them to clap for you like that, but... Hey, they... Okay, uh, guys, get out of here. Go away. They're getting paid in uh, Hawaiian pineapples. That's all I have. I have no cur- other currency than Hawaiian pineapples. That's going to be very limited, because it was all that you could bring back in your carry-on. Yeah, exactly. I, have, I had four crates of Hawaiian pineapples. <laughs> and most Which is them, technically a violation to bring those back, but somehow you got it through. 
and most of them are already rotten, so they get paid in rotten pineapples. Yeah, they really shouldn't be applauding. So we have an email. We haven't gotten an email in quite a while because I don't know. We had an email account. You guys don't like to communicate with us, but if you would like to, you can email us at brewbloodsshow at gmail dot com. And I'm going to say this guy is the official uh, postmaster of the of Brew Bloods and probably the break room by proxy. Uh, this guy James, we'll call him James T. I don't want to keep protect his identity, although I will give it his, his social security number here at the end of the email. But sure. He says, uh, "Quote: I have spent the last two weeks binge listening to your show, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm not sure if there ever was an explanation of where Out Go Out came came from, <laughs> but it cracks me up when you guys play that. I'm a mailman, so I've been listening out on the street, and you guys have made me laugh out loud more than a few times. My customers must be wondering what the hell I'm doing out there." Keep up the great work, Jim T, the postmaster of Brew Bloods. Well, thanks, Jim T. Appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate it, especially the fact that we now have an official mailman. So somebody can That's finally true. deliver us our beer without breaking it. <laughs> yeah, we can actually finally get our mail. But uh, the official explanation of Out Go Outs. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. Most people hate it. We have a very, I don't know. I don't know you say uh, that. I think it's mostly hate. Uh, but we have a very... Or maybe the, maybe the people who love it don't come out in mass exactly. force like the haters do. Exactly. Because the haters like, are out there. Exactly. It's like all you hear... You don't really hear when somebody loves a restaurant. You don't see them go to Yelp. There's a lot of hate, a, though. Not a lot of positive praise, but if there's hate, boy, somebody will let you know oh, yeah. about that. I think it's the prairie mob. <laughs> they, they don't like it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But the official explanation is... You, you probably have the full context here, but... Uh, at least of somebody doing it, like uh, some other, somebody famous. But <laughs> I don't even... So back in the break room days, which is our other podcast, which is back up and running now. All right. High gasoline. Five. High five. Out. High go. Five. Out. Go. So that was the original... It all goes around that. Yeah, that was the original recording of when it started because there was a band called... Oh, God. It was a <laughs> Scottish-Canadian band, and they had a song called Gasoline. Right. And... High five was thrown in there just because we had the Borat high five that we played all the time. uh, Because we play a lot of drops on that show. The band is called Inner the Haggis. And they are a Scottish-Canadian band. And they had a song called Gasoline. (laughs) And somehow, I think I was just trying to get to break. Or get to the end of the show and nobody would let me. I think it was probably going to... I think we... Because we used to play songs on the break room as our break. And we used to try to promote bands, uh, I guess, when we had a listening audience. Uh, maybe we didn't, and we just needed something to fill. But anyway, we used to do that, and you were saying all right, because you always say all right, and we have plenty of drops that prove that, because right. you were trying to get to the break, and then you said the name of the you said the name of the uh, song, and then for some reason, Dave and I were, were shouting out, and then you said go, yeah. like to get out of there. So out and go and out all got <laughs> intertwined, and uh, we ended up with that little piece of gold. All right. Gasoline. High five. High five. Out. High go. Five. Out. Go. <laughs> and then we, that became just part of the break room vernacular. Right. So much so that when we interviewed celebrities, we would get them to read these things. Now, the go, I can tell you where the go came from. That was a, uh, Mark and I have a favorite local radio station called The Ticket. And they used to play a drop from then head coach Bill Parcells where he said go. And so we were mimicking go. the way that he said go, or I was yeah. in that drop. And uh, so it all just kind of came together. It was just a... Uh, it's an organic thing. An organic thing. And then for some reason that became our thing to do when we're yeah. leaving a segment is out, go out. Yeah. And then we extended that to interviews and we got them to read our our wacky radio liners. <laughs> right. So like Marina Baccarin, you know, from Firefly and Homeland. Yes. This is Marina Baccarin from Firefly and Homeland. And you're listening to The Break Room. Gasoline, high, five out, go out. <laughs> and then we had Glenn Morshower. Hi, this is Glenn Morshower, and you're listening to The Break Room with Mark, Dustin, and Thomas. Out, go out, gasoline, high five. <laughs> and then we went to a, a sci-fi convention here, the Dallas Comic Con, and we just had random people read that. And that's why you out, hear... go out, exactly. gasoline, high five. That's why you hear random people yelling that. Yeah. That's where, so that it's, that's where it all came from. And it's it, That's also where... Gas online. Came from. <laughs> That's where Gas Online came from, yeah. <laughs> because uh, our other third guy on the other show, Thomas the Tank, uh, mistyped the quote for Marina to read, yeah. and it said Gas Online instead. So. <laughs> gas Online. It's all stuff. I don't know. It's yeah. just stuff that all came together, and it's a weird organic thing, and uh, I can understand loving it or hating it, honestly, because I love it and hate it. And it doesn't. Ju- it's not just confined to the podcast. We use it in regular life, too, so it's right. just, well, weird... It's our weird friend friend speak, I guess. We say out, go out when we leave. Exactly. Yeah. So while we were gone, we missed a lot of news because we didn't, you know, once you're in paradise, who cares about news? You're, you're amongst the palms and the, <laughs> the ocean and, uh, you know, 
all the new Pokemon you can catch. And so there was we even did, Hurricane coming. Mark was out there shirtless, just double right. burden it. No, I had saying the, take him away. I had done fingers over the nips. Well, true, but uh, we didn't pay attention to news. But we came back. We and, had thumbs on the nips, and then you were flipping it off, like off oh, yeah. your chest. It was really weird. And I was doing a handstand at the right. same time, and slowly doing it, of course, and he's slowly prying open the butt cheeks <laughs> right. just to expose it to the world. Exactly. Uh, well, we missed a lot of news, and uh, our like our friend Johnny B left several articles, and Stefan left some on our page, and we're not going to talk about those today because we unfortunately we have bigger news. We have bigger news, and it's and I, I'm sorry to do this, but we do have to get somewhat local, like really. So we're getting this this episode is really local. I don't to mind Dallas. it. Hey. We are in Dallas, and I yeah. know you hate Dallas, and I just kind of like Dallas okay. But we are in Dallas, so we need to embrace where we are. Yeah. Get it local. Get it local. Get it local on your ass. Ass. Home. Ass. Ass. Get it local on your ass. So that's our official theme song for getting local. So we had two big stories come out this week, and uh, Johnny B also put this on our page, but we'd already heard about this. But local brewery Revolver Brewing. Thanks for being current, Johnny. Yeah, way to go, Johnny. (laughs) Uh, Revolver Brewing out of Granbury, which is one of the mid-cities here in the Metroplex. Not Grand Prairie. No, Granbury. Granbury is not a mid-city, actually. Grand Bury is not? Grand Bury is south of Fort Worth. Oh, I, I can't Grand see, I Prairie those, is a mid city. I never I don't ever want to go there. It's like Dead Man's Land. I don't I try not to go there, so I always Grand, get them confused. Grand Bury is where you go lose all your money on the horses. Oh, that's Grand right. Grand Bury is south of Fort Worth. Right. There's too many just like there's too many belt lines, there's too many right. Prestons, there's too it's many, many Parklands lands in Dallas. Too many grands. Right. And frankly, too many Richland Hills. We don't need North Richland Hills and Richland Hills, frankly. That's true. One of them they should need be, to merge. One of them no, they should one of them them should just be detonated. Well, just make it one big Richland Hills. You don't need a north. All right, true. Just like we don't need uh, two Virginias. Dallas is like 10 times as big as Richland Hills. Right. There's not like specific area called East Dallas and North Dallas. We call it that to, to, to say the area, but that's not a township like North Richland Hills yeah, is. Yeah, like we tell you where Dowdy Ferry Road is. Cause, right. Because that's kind of the dead dog region. But. Exactly. But uh, Revolver Brewing out of Grand Brewery got purchased by 10th and Blake, which is a subsidiary, the craft division of Miller Coors. Now, when you say purchased, they took a majority stake. Majority stake, yes. Right. Much like they did with Terrapin and Hop Valley. And Revolver Brewing, not a, obviously not a nationwide brand. I think they still only distribute to Texas, but yes, they had over a million dollars in uh, sales or they, profit uh, last, week, or last year. The, they go to Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Waco, and surrounding areas. Generic. Yeah. But they make their, probably their most well-known beer here in Texas is called Blood and Honey. It's no like doubt a, about it. It's not even close, I would say. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I can't recall anything making a mark on my my taste mouth. The only other that beer. somewhat big one that they have, uh, I think, is probably uh, Sidewinder that's mass, quote-unquote mass-produced. Uh, their Mother's Little Fracker was kind of a big deal, too, for a little bit, but that's that's about it. Oh, and they had their Anodyne recently, which was a special release, which was a wine-based beer. Yeah. Uh, it's a beer aged in wine barrels, so... What, what, before we even get into this, what's your uh, opinion on Revolver? Do you have an overall opinion? Um, I give them an okay, like uh, Two Thumbs Sideways. I, the Blood and Honey, to me, is their standout beer. It's uh, I know uh, a lot of people don't necessarily like that beer, but if you're into spiced beers, it's a, it's a really good beer. And I can't say I cared for too much, too many of their other beers. I think you like the that. Fracker, too. Because uh, we, uh, we, we split a sixer to that. You're, you might be right. and You, you might know, be. It's in your dark wheel, uh, dark beer wheelhouse. Right. It, it, I probably did. But I can't say like they made a big mark in my life. They're no, they're no Lakewood or Petacolis, you know, as, for other local breweries. Uh, or community or any of those. Or community. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would agree. Um, Even Rabbit Hole, I would say, has made a bigger mark on my life than Revolver. <laughs> Yeah, I would say I've probably had more, honestly, even more Franconia than I've had uh, than I've had Revolver. Um, Revolver's just not one I ever reach for. It's like you know, Blood and Honey's there, and if I'm in the mood for something that is a little different, I'll go for that. But normally, it's not like a. I would say in Dallas, if you're going around and you're going to find common beers, Blood and Honey is one of those that's going to be there. And we'll get to some more stuff from Petacolis later, but. It's going to be my last choice, honestly, usually. I'm usually going to go for whatever IPA or whatever else they have there from somebody else. 
Uh, unless they just have nothing else and that's like the only craft option they have, then I'll, I might go for it. Or if I just happen to be in the mood for something like a golden, a spicy golden ale like right. that is, you know. It's a decent alternative, but it's not like one of the mainstays in my fridge. Right, exactly. I barely ever get it, honestly. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever actually bought it in bottles. I just have grabbed it on draft here and there. That's about it. Yeah, so uh, Tenth and Blake, which is Miller Coors craft, quote unquote, craft arm, right. which was headed up by Blue Moon and Lining Kugel. Uh, last, well, like I think two weeks prior to them buying Revolver, they bought or they took a majority stake in Terrapin and Hot Valley out of uh, Georgia and I forget the other state. Might have been Virginia. I can't remember. And they so they did the same thing there. Now, they started doing this because if you can't beat them, buy them up and make them worse. Right. Uh, is basically Miller Coors stance here. And uh, they saw like last year. Well, we'll see if they, they make them worse. That's, they, a, that's they, a question. Well, we'll see. They saw uh, single digit uh, sales declines. Uh, for the last quarter ending in June 30th. So they're they're taking a hard hit with Line and Kugel and Blue Moon, and so they decided to go on the offensive and start buying people up. And, you know, AB and Bev is doing the same thing. Sure. And uh, I don't know. I'm getting to that point now where, you know, we used to say, and I don't know if you still feel this way, we used to say that as long as they continue to make a good product, wouldn't discount them, but I'm starting to get really, really pissed off. And we're probably late to the game, at least I am, on being pissed off about this. But what I'm afraid of is exactly what we talked about a couple of episodes ago with the cores, where after Prohibition, you saw the bigger guys start to snap up the, the smaller guys and consolidate to the fact where AB and Bev were just Anheuser-Busch at the time. And Miller, or Coors, you know, were, were really the, the major domos of the beer industry. And we saw the product getting worse and worse and worse. And right now we've kind of been in a really nice sweet spot for craft beer right. that we have alternatives, but I'm so afraid that it's going to go back to being, I may be freaking out too much. Maybe I'm overreacting because it's hitting close to home, but I'm still afraid that that's going to happen. Well, my take on it, I have a couple of thoughts on it. One is I don't like, I don't like the fact that these companies make fun of this whole industry through their, brewed the hard way campaign and then on the flip side they have a subsidiary that sits there and buys the exact beers and tries to cater to the exact group that they're making fun of i don't really i find that kind of hypocritical for one yeah absolutely uh for two my other big problem that's one problem that's just kind of an annoyance but my big problem with it really is i don't i like what the state of texas actually did and we talked about this uh through text message uh earlier this week I don't like the fact that the Craft Beer Alliance or any of these craft beer, uh, basically organizations that are supposed to be supporting the little guy, if you get a majority stake bought out by AB InBev or Miller Coors, you should be booted from that that day because your interest is no longer with the little guy. You may try to claim you still do, you do your things the right way and you still make your same recipe and all that. That's a different argument to me. I think for the industry itself, you're going to have these big conglomerates that are going to push their agenda through their yeah. subsidiaries, Absolutely. and they're going to try to manipulate that market. And they should not be any part of the Craft Brewer Alliance anymore. You're not a craft brewery anymore well, at that point. I don't know about the Craft Brewer Alliance, but the other major story was that uh, they say this has been in the planning for about five months. They've been reviewing the rules, but and it just happened that it came out the same day as Revolver being purchased, or at least the announcement of that, is that the... Uh, the uh, Texas Craft Brewers Guild announced that same day that they have started. They are changing the definition of craft brewer, brewers, at least in Texas, saying that if you are, if you have a controlling interest in your brewery or you're owned by someone that does not qualify for the Craft Brewers Guild, you are no longer a craft brewer. Right, and that's and, totally valid. Yeah, and they said that um, they will. And Revolver is immediately kicked out as is Independence from. Uh, from Austin because right. they have a controlling or a partnership with uh, Lagunitas, which apparently is too big. Um, sure. If you define the parameters, it's not just, yeah. you know, we're not talking about just Revolver and their sales. If you're supported by Miller Coors, then you're a lot bigger entity at that point. And to qualify for the Texas Craft Brewers Guild, you have to be, you have to be licensed to operate in Texas. You have to produce fewer than 2 million barrels annually. And you have to derive the majority of your beer from traditional uh, or innovative brewing ingredients and fermentation. And it can't be a malt beverage. So right. immediately, Revolver is kicked out of this. And they are no longer, at least by Texas standards, considered a craft brewer. 
Now, I know we've had discussions about the, the bigger crapper alliance uh, before and the fact that they are also, they have like a majority ownership uh, or, or majority owned by somebody like AB InBev or Miller Coors. I can't remember who it was, but I think that's ridiculous too. Like I think, I think there's two sides to the coin because the people always say, well, are you being a hipster if you just don't drink it anymore because they're owned by the big guy? And if I really like a beer, like if one of my absolute favorite beers uh, gets bought up, uh, let's just say Founders gets bought up by AB InBev or gets a majority stake, am I never going to have another uh, Founders beer? No, I'm going to have a Founders beer. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But I also think that the bigger craft beer guys need to not sell out and actually make a, a larger alliance that counters out this AB InBev and Miller Coors distribution uh, that they have such a corner on. Uh, I think that's, I mean, I know some people just want to get paid too, and whatever, you make a business. Um, I kind of understand that too. Uh, you know, if you want to get a payout, I I think we all want to pay out on some level, so it's kind of hard to get too mad about that aspect of it. But at the same time, I think if they got their own distribution network and really got together and could counter out the distribution problems that a lot of these people have, then I think less of them would probably sell out because I think that's a big majority of why Revolver was talking about doing this too is they wanted more distribution. They can go a lot of other places and it's going to be a lot easier for them. And you know, well, and that, I think that's what Greg Koch from uh, the owner of Stone Brewing was trying to do with his crappier angel fund right. that he set up. And I think it was something like $100 million. And he said it's not for the microbrewer that is just getting started. This is for the 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 craft brewer who's kind of reached their upper financial limit and they need more resources to expand right or to get better distribution and he's trying to head off exactly what we saw with revolver selling to miller cores and you have to wonder i have no problem with somebody making a profit on their creation right what i have a problem with is people that start up their breweries with the express intent to immediately sell out as soon as possible and I can't say I don't know anybody involved involved in Revolver. I know our friend Javi seems to think that they were they only built the brewery to sell out. I don't know. I don't know how they claim things are not going to change. I hope that's not the case. Right. I understand wanting to make a profit and you know relax your work hours because it's an intensive job. But you have you do have to make it does the question does come up in your mind. Sure, if that was the intent, yeah, sure, yeah. And there are um, some breweries you can you can absolutely tell that they started up just to you know just to turn around and get sold. And then you have the whole flip side. What since this whole distribution market for the craft beer is not in place yet, um, you know, quite honestly, I do like the fact that even though they're not my personal favorite IPA of choice, I do like the fact that I can find Goose Island pretty much anywhere now. I can be uh, at uh, the Monte Carlo in Vegas, and the free beer I can get while I'm gambling is a Goose Island IPA, which would never have happened if they didn't make the deal with AB InBev. You'd be yeah, stuck with a Budweiser. Look, I get it. I so mean, that's that's also the the positive side of it, but um, it just depends on how, how much it, it keeps going this way because ultimately you don't want them... It, it's like the whole old Walmart argument that well you know everything's cheaper so i go there but it's driving all the mom and pops and then when they drive everybody out then they're going to screw everything up and make everything low quality which is the same thing that could happen with the beer it's like it's kind of a balance act it's a balancing act that's why i think they really need to get a real true nationwide craft alliance to try to address issues like distribution i well, think they i need to do that urgently i agree and i personally would love to see greg coke and uh sam calioni out of dogfish join up Create the Justice League of craft brewers, <laughs> right? And get in there and make, maybe not make a direct brewery company, but make somebody that is kind of like a major domo in craft brewing and help help the little guys. I know that's what exactly what Coke is trying to do at a stone. I know that's what maybe they're just not quite there yet as far as the you know reaching those people, or maybe they don't they can't make enough of an offer to counteract Miller Coors, right? But if you got enough of the big guys together. Maybe we could do it and help these guys and keep them from selling out and stay independent. I'm not. I'm like you. I'm not going to say I'll never have Revolver beer again because I probably will. Right. I think, and it's just like the uh, Breckenridge Vanilla Porter. For me, that used to be used to be one of my standby standby go to beers, and I would always have some in my fridge. But since they got bought by AB InBev, I think. Uh, 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 yeah, I think you're right. Yep. I haven't bought any more, and it's not that I'm. I don't know. I think it's just puts a sour taste in my mouth to where I'm not saying I'll never have it again, 
right. but I'm not seeking it out. And because part of me just doesn't want to, I don't want to support that. Now, if it comes to drinking a Breckenridge versus a Bud Light, I'm going to reach for the Breckenridge. Right. And they're going to occasionally get a few of my shekels in their pocket. That's, but, that's why I gave the Goose Island example at the casino. But I don't. You know, it's, a, it's yeah. those situations. You have to make the best of it sometimes. But I'm not going to directly right. seek to support them anymore. And frankly, that goes for Revolver as well. Now, this is obviously my few dollars is not going to hurt them as a company. They're going to have plenty of everyday drinkers. They're going to have a lot better distribution. They'll probably end up making a lot more money. Probably a lot of people don't even realize it happened. No, they don't. We're in a very niche community. We're, right. you know, not, I'm just not going to say we're the only ones that care about it, but in this little community, we're the only community that cares and, about it. And I was going to say just another thing about Goose Island, because we always bring them up in these discussions. Um, the only thing I really ever seek out from them is their Bourbon County stuff. You know, I yeah. never, I never just go buy a six pack of Goose Island IPA. Uh, even if I think it's probably a fairly neutral to decent IPA, I, I just never do that unless I'm, you know, maybe if I'm at a convenience store and it, it's that or, uh, you know, a Bud Light, then I'll grab a six of that. But it's just not one I ever seek out like you're talking about. It's yeah. it's like the Breckenridge thing. If there's certain scenarios where it comes up, I'll go for that just because I like the taste. And again, that's the I, I guess maybe that does help a little bit that it's bringing this kind of palate to the masses. Uh, so maybe they'll get more of a taste of the craft beer side. I don't know. I don't know any research on that or seen any you know stats on that. But. Yeah, you're not wrong in that. I, I just don't want to see the consolidation I did before. I don't right. want us to return to the 70s sure. as, as far as they just generic. I honestly don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I don't but either. I, but I get your fear. I, yeah, I, I don't either, but I, or at least I hope not. Yeah. I hope enough people will stay independent and realize that they can have, once they get to a point, they can reduce their hours. They can hire more staff. They, it's going to be tough up front. You're going sure. to put in a lot of ton of hours, but I would hope they can realize like the independent owner of a restaurant, you can have a comfortable career and you can still maintain a family and you can still enjoy some nice profits. Now you may not get 5 million in your right. bank account one day, but you know, you can still make a decent life out of yourself and, and key as long as you, it just feels like people are not making beer the priority or making beer as an art, making art a priority. <laughs> it's like Thomas Kincaid being an artist sure. to where at one point he was this master of light you know, in his paintings. And then he kind of sold out for the money and everything right. was just, everything was the same or Peter Max as an artist. Everything's sure. got super patriotic imagery. Right. And you're selling out just to make money. And I understand the drive for money, but sure. at some point it just starts to feel uh, like you've, <laughs> your, your soul is a desert, a, a waste, a wasteland. So you're such a dirty hippie, Mark. And speaking of breweries that, uh, and by the way, uh, Goose Island. By the, uh, I have two points here. Goose Island announced two more recalls for the Bourbon counties in the past week. <laughs> awesome, by the way. And then uh, yeah, the, if they keep getting tainted. I won't go get those anymore either. Yeah, <laughs> having already experienced the taint. And then uh, one of the breweries I was talking about that uh, was started that only had their mind, it seemed like, on making dollars was Dead Cowboy out of Rockwall. I don't think they ever produced one beer. They were selling shirts before they actually had the brewery open. Right. Or made one beer. And I don't think they ever officially started up. Their Twitter account is still somewhat active. But it's all somebody on untapped. Just the beers they're drinking now. But Right. Anyways, it's a sad state of affairs. And I hope it doesn't... It's been... they The, the Miller Coors and AB and Bev have been particularly rapacious in the, in the last few weeks, the last few months. And I hope it slows down somewhat. I hope we see our resistance. Like... The force is with all of you. <laughs> Just keep up the rebellion. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, on the other side of this, we're going to get to our very first Pedicolas beer. <music> beer drinking is a sport and a fun one at that, but many people are interested in either how it's made or they want to make beer themselves. When you take a brewery tour, it may seem intimidating because of the giant vats, the space required, and all the manufacturing accoutrements. But when you break it down, all beer is made largely the same way, with some variations depending on style and recipe. First, a brewer needs the right equipment. For the simplest setup, you need sanitizer to clean the equipment, a kettle for boiling, a container for fermentation, a secondary vessel for bottling, a large spoon or mash paddle to stir the boil with, and most importantly, the ingredients water, malt, yeast, and hops. Next, you need to sanitize all of your equipment, and I mean everything. Sanitization helps to prevent nasty microbes from destroying a beer, and it happens to many brewers from the home brewer to the big guys like Goose Island. After that, it's time to start the boil by filling your brew kettle with water and applying the heat. 
Once the boil starts, a brewer will remove the heat momentarily and stir in the malt slowly. When the malt has been stirred in, a brewer returns the kettle to the heat and lets it start boiling again. When the boil has started again, this is when the brewer adds the first batch of hops, known as bittering hops. Generally after this, the boil is maintained for about 60 minutes, though this can vary depending on the hops used. When the hour is up, that's when the heat is turned off and a brewer adds flavor and aroma hops and lets them steep for about 10 minutes. The resulting product is what's known as wort. Next, the wort needs to be cooled as quickly as possible to below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There are many ways to do this, but some home brewers use something as simple as a cold water bath or a cooler full of ice. Once the wort has cooled, the brewer then transfers it to a fermentation vessel, which is most commonly a carboy for the home brewer. After that, more water is added to the vessel to bring it up to a full batch, which is 5 gallons for the home brewer commonly. The final step before fermentation is adding yeast to the fermenter, also known as pitching the yeast. The fermenter is then sealed and the fermenter is moved to a clean, dark, and cool spot. Over the next 7-10 to 10 days, the yeast go to work converting the sugar in the wort to alcohol and carbon dioxide. Foam will begin to rise inside the fermenter as this happens. A brewer keeps an eye on the fermentation and when bubbling slows or stops and the foam starts to recede, fermentation is done and it's ready to be bottled, though some recipes call for a second fermentation. The beer is then transferred from the fermenter to a bottling vessel and ultimately into your mouth. So we've talked about pedicolas a lot on the show. No, we never talked about them. And it's always, almost always in reference to our one of our favorite beers, Velvet Hammer. We've not only talked to or about pedicolas, we've talked to Michael Pedicolas on this show. We have. We, we talked to him very briefly. In, in a very drunken state. Yeah. So well, I appreciate him taking the whipping that was us being drunk and asking him questions. Yes. And uh, appreciate that. Uh, yes. I don't remember what episode it was, but it was back when we talked about the Untapped Festival right. in Dallas uh, a few months ago, like March, April, whenever that was. Yeah, something like that. But we talk about Pedicles a lot, and really this brewery is, it seems to have the spirit that is in complete opposition of what we just saw happen with Revolver selling out to Miller Coors. At least I hope so. Right. But Michael Pedicles and every, the whole team at Pedicles seems to embody that spirit of independent brewing, and striving for not only creativity but remaining small because they still don't bottle and again we're getting extremely local in this episode but yes they still don't bottle so you can only find it on tap right and at your local growler shop also on tap of course right and i would think that any indicators that we know as uh, extreme outsiders uh seem to indicate that they do embrace that that mindset because he does use his uh lawyer abilities to seemingly fight for the little guy and fight for the craft beer scene to try to make it better mm-hmm. in Texas. So, I, I mean, all all indicators point to the fact that he's not someone that's looking to sell out and make some cash. And I think uh, even um, this past Monday, he went to Austin to try... I can't remember the exact issue, but some issues coming up before the Texas legislature around... Uh, I'm probably wrong, but distribution or something like that, I think. <laughs> and he was going back to fight. <laughs> Thoroughly researched. Yeah, I can't. I read about it the other day, and I can't remember now. But uh, and I'm drawing a blank, and I don't want to stop to look up sure. facts. But because facts, you know, they're just facts. Yeah, and he did weigh in on the revolver situation on his Twitter account. Uh, you could go find them. Uh, it's at Pedicolas, correct? Yes, correct. Yep. So you could go there and. and what, did, what did he say? I didn't see that. Uh, I don't want to misquote him, so I'm not gonna. T- I'm not gonna. Uh, Quote it, but I know it was something along the lines of he basically doesn't blame him for doing it, but it seems like something he wouldn't he wouldn't be pursuing. But uh, th- there's a lot of back and forth about a lot of back and forth about that, just because that was such a big deal locally, and they were you know they're probably I don't know what they are in distribution comparison. I think Pedicolis is is bigger, but yeah, he said uh, here I found it. He said personally, I'm happy for my friends over there. Saddened they are no longer craft brews or craft beer. Still love their current crew. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's he's a a small guy working for the the big the small beer scene and like trying to make things better from a law perspective. Not only well, not only a law perspective here in Dallas, but a beer perspective as well. And the, the brewery itself, I know, works for not only quality but consistency. And they try to always have balanced beers. Absolutely. Now, like Mark said, um, we use their Velvet Hammer as the gold standard. 
It was originally my idea to review that one, but I think uh, Mark, for once, actually convinced me of something. I he, took out he, my, made a, he made a legitimate argument about something that I made took sense. Out, I took out my 12-gauge and shot that idea down. Right, exactly. Well, my, uh, For my, once, I actually agree with him. Uh, and the reason makes sense, because we've talked about Velvet Hammer so much and so many times, and it's such the gold standard for comparisons that everyone's going to know we're going to give it 5 out of 5, and it's going to be a boring episode. I agree with that argument. It makes sense. So we decided to tackle something different from them. Uh, another it's, thing just to mention about Velvet Hammer. Um, you know, before we were talking about how uh, Revolver Blood and Honey is one of those, if they have a few craft taps, it always shows up. I would say that is also very true of Velvet Hammer. That, sure. that seems to be in a lot of local places, and it's one of your better choices. It's, it's readily available everywhere. Yeah, if, there, if there's there's a few things guaranteed in life. One is that the Kool-Aid man at some point will randomly break break through the wall in your house sure. and destroy your life uh, with AK-47s. The other is that Velvet Hammer will always be in taps somewhere in Dallas and almost almost every tap uh, situation here in the region. If they have find something, Velvet Hammer. yeah, if they have something outside of just the standard few, uh, you know, ABN Bev taps. You're going to find Deep LM IPA or Pedicolis, more yeah. than likely. You're going to Velvet Hammer. You're going to find one of those two. A Velvet Hammer is wide and far-reaching, and deservedly so. And right. that's why I didn't want to do that. That's why I took out my uh, tank and I blew dust in the face uh, with, you know, some... I didn't blow in the face. Uh, <laughs> I shot you in the face. Well... I blew you somewhere else, but, but I shot you in the here. face yeah. uh, with uh, my shells and destroyed that idea. I knocked it right out of the air because I... You know what? I know you like our audience to be bored, but I don't like our audience to be bored. Hey, I just wanted to talk about one of my favorite beers. That's I know, all it was. I know. So I we're that. talking about it now around another review. So there you go. But I've still got to talk about it, and that's the important. I'm thing. trying to make the viewers happy. So just for an official record, Velvet Hammer five out of five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we're sitting. We're talking today about another one that I think came out just last year, and I could be wrong on that. But it's called the Sit Down or I'll Sit uh, You Down Double IPA. It's uh, listed as coming out on 9-9-2013. Uh, oh, uh, I'm very wrong. Beer, so. <laughs> Three years gone then. <laughs> Never mind. For some reason I thought I, it was just last year, but uh, clearly I'm very wrong on that. Yeah, very wrong. Very, very. So uh, before we get into that, here's a little bit about Pedicolis Brewing. <laughs> Pedicolis Brewing Company is the brainchild of lawyer-turned-brewer Michael Pedicolis. First inspired by his mom, Jackie Pedicolis, and her home-brewed Mexican-style beer, Michael has taken his passion and turned it into a praised DFW craft beer company. Michael turned from his career as a full-time lawyer to embrace his passion for craft beer in 2010. Pedicolis Brewing Company was born off of this passion in December 2011, when the first batch of Velvet Hammer was produced. Pedicolis Brewing has won many awards since its creation, including gold medals from the Great American Beer Festival for the Royal Scandal, an English Pale Ale, and Great Scott, a Scottish Ale. In 2013, Michael was elected to the board of directors for the Texas Craft Brewers Guild, and after only one year, moved to the position of co-chair of the Legislative Committee. From this post, he has made efforts to change archaic Texas state laws outlining the methods in which craft beer companies must handle their distribution. So the BJCP for Imperial IPA is that from appearance, it should be anywhere from a golden amber to a medium reddish copper. The aroma should be a prominent to intense hop aroma. No surprise being an Imperial IPA. Uh, flavors should be that the hops are strong and complex, and you can see any, anything from American, English, and or noble hop varieties. Mouthfeel will be smooth to medium light body, and the overall impression is that it's intensely hoppy, very strong pale ale without the big maltiness and or deeper, deeper malt flavors of barley wine. So it's going to be a very, very strong beer, and typically what we see in double IPAs is really the hoppiness is not, even let's call it double IPA, typically it's not as hoppy as you would expect, at a rate, and conversely, what you see in a lot of uh, single IPAs. Yeah, that's true, um, and that happens even more so when you get up to the triple IPAs. Uh, some double IPAs can really wreck your palate, as we've talked about many times. But um, yeah, you're right. It does it does change as you go up. Uh, as you go up in hoppiness, I figure. I guess they feel like too much pine, and it's just going to totally destroy your tongue, and you'll never want to drink again, and uh, you'll just curdle up and die. So at some point, they have to balance it out a little bit. It's yeah, it's an interesting paradox because you would think in, when you think of uh, double and triple, you would think it would get more hoppy and palate wrecking, but it's it's an interesting how it's conversely so. It is an interesting. It's an, it's an interesting, conversely <laughs> so. Yeah, that's very true. Now, some of the other beers that they have, um, the one we're reviewing today is the Sit Down or I'll Sit You Down uh, Imperial IPA, and we'll get into that a little bit more. 
Uh, that one sits at a, uh, a nice 10% ABV. Pedicola is not, a, not afraid to put a uh, high ABV on their beers for sure. No, they're not. Uh, which I don't, I don't have a problem with. But some of their other highly rated uh, beers, and we'll get, again, we'll get into the sit down here in a minute. Uh, the Duke, it's a barley wine. It's, uh, it's at 92% approval. And it came out back in 2013 and sits at an ABV of 12%. The Velvet Hammer, as we've talked about many times and even many times in this episode, has a 9% ABV. Came back and came out in uh, 2012, uh, and it gets 92% as well. The Great Scott is a Scottish ale uh, or Scotch ale, uh, and it comes out 6.8% uh, and a 90. And then they have the Wintervention as well uh, that came back out in 2012, 10%, and an 87% rating. So a lot of their big their big beers that are around uh, quite, most of the time uh, get pretty high ratings, and uh, most of them have pretty high ABVs. So. Yeah, like the, the another one, the Pedicles Black Curtains, the Imperial Stout has an 11% ABV as well. So Right. It's, uh, you know, it's it, it sounds like they'd be especially boozy. But they're really, I will say this, and yeah, that's high ABV, but he will a say lot it. of times you don't notice the booze. Yeah. I feel like they, many times, and I've, I don't think I've had everything that they put out, uh, right. just because of missed certain seasonals here and there, but everything I've had is pretty well balanced, boozy, and, and I think they're hitting their mark there. I would agree with that, and they even make a different version of Velvet Hammer called the Sledgehammer uh, that I believe ramps up the ABV in between 12 and 14%, depending on which and version you get. And they also have the Pick Hammer, too, which I can't remember what that comes in at, but that was a special release as well. Right, but even that one, not not really boozy, 14%. No. So basically, if you go to a Pentacles Brewery Tour and you use all your tokens on uh, some of these high-end stuff, you might, you might want to Uber there and back. Yep. Because uh, it, it can really uh, it can kick you pretty hard. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll put it that way. I may have experienced it before. <laughs> I'll put it that way. It's, it, it can be dangerous. Yes. Uh, now, the sit down or I'll sit you down, like we said, comes in at 10% ABV. And the official description is, back in the day, Michael Petacolis' brother Charlie was a cop. And cops filmed a few of his arrests. The best of which was or involved a deadbeat considering resistance to uh, his arrest. With baton drawn, Charlie demanded, sit down or I'll sit you down. Since the episode aired over 10 years ago, we've uttered the line a million times to one another and laughed every time. <laughs> We're paying tribute to that line by using it to name our Imperial IPA, a big beer that will sit you down if you don't do it first. As for the beer itself, the intent is to exhibit the fresh and bright character of the hops. We dry hopped it <laughs> with over a pound of hops per barrel. The wow. hop bitterness is high, but not at all harsh. The hop flavor is high, fresh, and lively. Yet with all of our beers... We're all about balance, and this one is no exception. Yeah, that's some some interesting Sanskrit there in the middle. Yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> now, the ratings here. Beer Advocate gave it no score. What? Uh, How does Beer Advocate not give it a score? That's who crazy. Knows. Uh, Ray Beer, however, gave it a 96 overall and an 81 in style. Very solid. And Untapped gives it a 4.07 out of 5 with uh, 5,307 unique reviews as of today. So even that's a little... I know they list this as a microbrewery, but I feel like Petacolis is big enough uh, in this area to have had more than that. But, you know... Actually, I, guess, I would consider them for not bottling. I actually think that's a pretty high number of reviews. Yeah, I just feel like they're everywhere around here. Hey, that's yeah, all. agreed. Let's go agreed. And if somebody goes for a craft beer, I feel like people know Petacolis a lot of times. Um, just hearing generic chatter, right. you know, I'm always scanning all the generic chatter you're about always, craft beer. Right, you're always on the shortwave radio scanning. Pretty much. Moving up and down the dial, up and down the <laughs> dial. And I note every instance when it's mentioned. Right, even on the Tejano stations. Oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Even though I don't know Spanish, I, I listen anyway. You're just like, donde esta Petacolis? Right, exactly. Craft beer. <laughs> donde esta craft beer on the radio dial. Exactly. All right, so let's uh, start examining this bad boy. Eh, I think I'm just going to leave. I'm right. done. Well, you go ahead, and I'll, I'll continue. <laughs> Appearance-wise, this one is definitely a deep golden color, orangish, to, orangish gold, I guess, like a like a sunset. It is. It has a nice little sunset quality. Uh, we use the official IPA glasses. Mark doesn't have a toaster, but he does have official IPA glasses. Right. Toasters so he knows are, where to spend the money. Look, toasters are not important. Right. I can toast in an oven if I want to. I can get a toaster oven if I wanted to combine the best of the two. I'm not going to have a toaster in this house. I will we'll not see. stand for a toaster. Do you I'm, see a toaster? I'm going to sneak a toaster in. I won't day. stand for it. You know what? I'll reject it to half court. <laughs> no, it'll be here. As you walk in the house, I reach up and slap I'm you in the sneak face. sneak in the middle of the night. I'm going to hook a toaster up. You're going to walk down. Oh, no. It's going to be there. All of my dogs are on guard for toaster duty. <laughs> All oh, yeah. the time. I trained Honey, our old Weimer, to look just for toasters. <laughs> Well, even if she finds one, she's she likes me, so she'll let no, me sit no. there. No, no. She look. She knows you. She likes you, but she will not stand for this toaster. <laughs> bro, like trying to sneak a toaster to my house, she will bite you square in the nuts and throw you out of the house. Oh, fair enough. I like to see her pick me up and throw me out. That would be that would almost be worth saying. Maybe not the nut biting, but the but the second <laughs> part. 
So, yes, it does seem to uh, hold the appearance that the BGCP says it should. And it's, it is unfiltered. Yeah, it's unfiltered, and it's retaining a little bit of a head, too. A little bit. Uh, we poured it uh, into our IPA glasses, which, if you're not familiar, you could probably do a Google image search on that, but it's uh, it's got a rib-for-her-pleasure stem on it. It has a lot of lacing, too. Uh, a lot of lacing, and then yeah. the glass is like a, kind of like a bell on top, somewhat. It's not like a somewhat. not like a tulip glass quite. It's not quite that sharp of a curve. No. But it's definitely tapered near the top. It focuses inwards uh, near the top. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a skinnier. It's like a Richard Simmons... You know, if he actually dealt with a tulip glass and made it lose a little poundage, it's like a shrunken version of that. And then it adds uh, the stem instead of just having the standard little stem. It has the, like you said, ribbed stem. Right. Ribbed for all of our pleasure, really. Uh, really, And yeah. if you want to compare it to a woman, it's like a pear-shaped woman. If you want to like, speak to the fashion industry, it's a pear-shaped woman. Yeah, a pear-shaped absolutely. Glass. But that being said, uh, I, think it, I think it definitely uh, holds up to the standards for visualization. Aroma-wise? Very, and like we've seen with some of our recent IPAs, very prominent uh, West Coast nose there. Yeah, very prominent West Coast nose, but it's also not extremely overwhelming. No, it's, it's not, not like a punch to the, to the face or anything. Yeah, you, you just tell it's there for it's sure. It's not like how my dogs attack you when you try to bring a toaster in this house. It's not quite that bad, but it, but it's, you know, it's right. there. And I would say there's not really, I don't really get any malty aroma from really? this Really? I get a pretty good significant amount really? of little I, malt. Yeah, I don't really get that as much. I do get the West Coast, though. Yeah, this is in sharp contrast to the, the Imperial IPA we had last week, the Lanakai Moku Imperial IPA, which had no scent at all. Well, yeah, that one, uh, it's a yeah. It's That's a all yeah. I can say about it. <laughs> it's a yeah. But yes, this one definitely has definitely has the aromas that I would expect for this particular style. And like you said, good lacing on the glass and, uh, you know, decent head retention. Obviously well. no bottle to review this week. No, this, yeah, came straight from the growler and... Uh, the only way you can get pedicles. By the way, the, this uh, this beer marks our first Snapchatty. Uh, I snapchatted this. If you want to sign it, if you I don't do you sign up for. I guess you follow somebody know. on the Snapchats. I'm sure you download it and create a username and follow people. Yeah, that would be we're, my assumption. I don't, I don't really know how to follow anybody like outside of my Facebook friends list that it just like auto auto shows you everybody. But right. anyways, if you know how to Snapchat, uh, you can find us on there. We're Brewbloods, and I snapchatted a couple of photos of this beer. So <laughs> if you like the snappy chats. If that's a thing, it's. I'm still not sure that I'm using Snapchat right because I'm an old. But he might have just Snapchatted his wiener. He doesn't know. Yeah, I don't know. But at least it was next. The beer was still in the picture. Right. Exactly. As I was dipping it slowly, <laughs> I did a Snapchat video and slowly dipped it into the beer. It's one way to consume it. But it wasn't my glass. It was yours. So congratulations, right. you're drinking my wiener beer. <laughs> well, let's see if it affects the taste. Very, very citrusy up front. I would say somewhat like a Meyer lemon in a sort of a, in a refreshing fashion, not an astringent fashion, like a, yeah, like a Lysol lemon scent or something like that, or that, you know, retro nasal thing we've talked about in the past, translating smell to taste, but like a kind of a sweet Meyer lemon. You know, this one, just to bring it back to other beers that we've reviewed, this one reminds me a little bit of the Hercules we did a few weeks ago. It's not it's not quite I think this is more citrusy than that one and a little more malty than that one. But I definitely get like some pretty strong piney back end uh, on the back of the tongue after you drink it. You get that nice that nice citrusy malt on the front end and then you get the piney on the back end and that's I think that's what reminds me of that one. Yeah, you get a uh, nice lemony up front and a resiny on the back, and like it's yeah. almost like you're hiking through some Northern California, like through the wet redwoods or something, and eating just and picking just up eating pine, for eating some pine, reason, just, just grazing up, on it, picking up pine needles and like right. know, grazing like a cow, passing it through your second stomach <laughs> as as we humans are wont to do, and then regurgitating and eating all and over just, again, and eating blocks of resin. Oh yeah, of course, just eating yeah, and then you you produce it, you you vomit it back up, and you eat it again. It's almost like it's exactly what this beer is like. Except in a good way. Yeah, and it, of course. Is there yeah. a bad way to eat your vomit? No, I don't think there is. Uh, I think that could give it a bad give a bad connotation. Maybe if you vomit it into a toaster and, and burn it and then try to eat that, sure, that's that's a bad way to eat your vomit. But, you know, just your normal vomit, uh, you know, on a plate, uh, you can take that right down. You know, I would say on second taste, the pine edge seems to fade a little bit more. Second and third... Second and third drink. Well, probably because your tongue is getting used to the, the pine needles in your mouth. Probably so, but I feel like the citrus stuff comes out even more the yeah, more you drink it. The citrus definitely comes... You know, I know we look... 
Everyone knows we hate fruit. Mm. We hate fruity. Any any fruit personification, they're going to get curb stopped in this house, in the studio. We hate them being alive. We don't mind yeah. them being dead and drinking their sure. blood. We don't mind drinking the blood. Yeah. And I'm thankful for their sacrifice here. I'm thankful that Pedicolas took uh, took an AK-47 to their head and, and shot them into the vat. Absolutely. Uh, the little tiny Meyer lemons, because we all know Meyer lemons are always tiny. Of course. They're the weakest of the lemons. But <laughs> I'm glad. I mean, it really is becoming more fruit-forward, citrus-forward, uh, the more you drink it, for sure. And the the mountains of California just kind of fade to the background. Yeah, they really do, which that, that makes it different from, you know, a, a green flash offering or a Hercules. It definitely trans. Yeah. Those don't fade. I mean, you keep the you keep the piney resin taste the whole time. But this one, I'm not saying it's gone, but it, it, it fades to the background but it's trans- as you drink this. But it's transforming like an Optimus Prime in your mouth. Yes. It's becoming a, new, a whole new thing. It's like Optimus Prime took a new form, or he may be transferred out of uh, truck form. He, uh, he transferred into his robot form, his robot form. Now, they do say on their commercial description that's a little more complete here on Rate Beer that this is something that you would perhaps pair with Indian food or Thai or jerk chicken. I could totally see that. Tired jerk chicken? Thai or jerk chicken? Oh, if they said tired, like like we had some regular jerk chicken, or you, if you want the really tired... <laughs> some, some stuff that's been around for about four days. <laughs> it's, we, it's, it's pretty dry. No, it's it's pretty beaten. We no, made, we're not talking about that. We had this chicken, then we made him run a few laps. <laughs> right, exactly. We tired him out, then we jerked him. <laughs> exactly. We jerked no, him off and put him in the, into your plate. It may be good with that, too, but I could see Thai spices and Indian food spices going well with this. Yeah, really the, the sweet, hoppy edge tends to play nice with your spicier foods, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I'm quite enjoying this, Mark. And I'm just going to get some generic commenta- uh, commentary as I'm drinking it. Mouthfeel-wise, it's got... It's definitely... Um, it's not super light, but it's not cloying either. And it's got a pretty pretty good little high carbonation. Not super high, but high carbonation from what I'm used to with Imperial IPAs. A lot of them taste almost more like... At least in my experience, at least how I think of them. Almost more like wine with a little bit of carbonation. Sure. In a little bit. But this is de- this definitely has a more present carbonation to it. Do you think it has any taste of alcohol, caramel, and baking spice? That's one one comment out there. Uh, no. Alcohol is pretty much non-present in the taste here. I agree. I don't know where they're getting that from. Uh, I don't know what baking spice tastes like because I've never consumed spices directly. I always add something. I always Me consume too. my spices I, yeah. indirectly. Uh, resinous mouthfeel. Someone said that about mouthfeel. Well, yeah, we said that resonate, yeah. sure. And... Yeah. Yeah, but it's, again, I, I think, overall, I think they've done a pretty good job of balance here. Very vibrant, hoppy, and citrus notes. Uh, nose, yeah, I would agree with that. Exactly as it should be. Hazy honey pour, we talked about that. Yeah, so we're in agreement with the people that are rating it high, I think. Um, I haven't really seen anybody really tear it up too much so far, so that's that's actually a good indicator, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, normally you have some people that rate stuff a one or a two. Uh, I'm not not really seeing any of that out there. I think three is the lowest, lowest I've seen. So no, they said someone said no aroma. Uh, I disagree with that. Oh uh, yeah, didn't yeah. Well, then that person doesn't have a nose. Peels the enamel off your teeth bitter. I disagree with that too. Again, someone doesn't have a tongue. <laughs> someone doesn't understand what bitter is and what the enamel on their teeth is. So ratings, ratings. Why don't you go first, Dustin? Uh, okay, fine. I'll go first. Um, double IPA, that's a category that I hold in high regard. I love double, double IPAs. That is not breaking news to anybody that's ever heard this show before. And you love Pedicolas. And I do love Pedicolas. Uh, Michael himself and his uh, his products. So I love every form of Pedicolas. Uh, I don't know if he knew I loved him, but now he does. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really was looking forward to this beer. Um, again, we've talked about Velvet Hammer so much and how much we love that that I wanted to have another one uh, that was highly rated uh, to see if it did hold up uh, to the high rated uh, category that it is in. And I have to say, amongst the double IPAs we've had recently, and we've had some solid ones, the double, the, the Hercules double IPA is solid, uh, or we've had some solid double IPAs over the course of the show. Uh, we've had some pinnacles. We've had uh, Pliny the Elder. Um, Heady you know, Topper? Heady Topper, yeah. I mean, we've had Top of the Pops when it comes to, to Dippas, as Mark likes to go around saying. Mm-hmm. Hey, bro, I'm going to have a Dippa. Yeah, bro. But, um, you know, so we've had those. And so this one, this was a brewery I held in high regard. 
and this is a beer style I, I hold in high regard, and it had a lot of hype going into it. So it had a lot to go against, quite honestly. Oh, and, I'm glad you're not lying to us once again. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that's a lot to go against. That's a lot of different factors, and it's that's a tough road to hoe. And I would say, I would say they did quite well. Um, I think this is one of the more balanced double IPAs I've had. Uh, if I'm in the mood for something that has a little more citrus and a little less piney resin taste, this is something that would fill that void or would fill that desire. So, overall, I think uh, this is a really solid, uh, yet another really solid offering from a really solid brewery. And I would give this one a 4.5 out of 5. I, too, have a strong affinity for Pedicoles, no surprise. I'm not as much of a West Coast IPA fan, or I would even say as much of an IPA fan as you are. But we've had, like you said, it's been in good, heady company, as it were. And yeah, that's a nice throw to the heady topper. I like that. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, uh, haven't, I don't think I've had this beer before now. And I'm only going off previously the high expectations we've had with and, and high results, great results with their other beers. So given those that swirling combination of factors, I expected high quality out of this beer and we got it. I expected a well-balanced beer and we got it. I expected... Uh, Obviously, a West Coast IPA, and we got it. <laughs> and however, what I was expecting just for an Imperial IPA was that it'd be a little more boozy than it was and less hoppy than it actually is. So within the style, maybe it doesn't exactly, it's not, it's it's a little bit of a square peg in a round hole situation because it's maybe it's not exactly following that. It's not a, it's not a palate wrecker, but then again, a lot of IPAs aren't either. So it almost aligns more with, to me at least, aligns more with a single IPA, for lack of a better term a regular IPA than perhaps an Imperial IPA, which tend to be a little more boozy and a little more smooth drinking. Well, I would say maybe even a triple because triples tend to be less hoppy and more uh, citrusy. Maybe, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe it fits. It's to me, it's somewhere between a single and a double IPA. Yeah. It's not, it's neither here nor there, but it's a good beer. And to me, I, if I had to put a name or a, a label for this beer, it would be dangerous because <laughs> it is uh, it is Johnny dangerously. It's hoppy dangerously because it is, 10% ABV, it, to me, it, it drinks like a regular IPA, uh, and that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot like the Odell um, Mercenary. Right. A highly smooth, drinkable IPA that you could have a lot of and not even notice. because We, you, we do need to bring Odell on to the do. show at some point. But, and that's why it's precisely why it's so dangerous, and I've gotten in trouble with Mercenary before, because you don't, <laughs> you don't notice the boozy flavor, and so your mind doesn't, until you hit that wall and you're like, face down slobbering drunk <laughs> you know that that's precisely why it's dangerous but that's why mark drunk tweets everything that's garbage but it achieves the balance really really well and i think it hits all the right notes for me i appreciate it's got a it's not significantly different up front but i appreciate the fact that it transforms the more you drink it into a different beer in some ways not highly different it's not like uh it's not like you went from an optimus prime prime to a bumblebee along sure. the way but uh, it transforms enough to where you find something new in just about every sip. So that's good. So I, too, am going to give this beer... Boy, I, it's, it's, I can't, it's hard to knock it on anything because I don't want to knock on anything. But I don't think it's exactly what I was looking for in a, in a uh, double IPA because it's not quite as... Just say as, Dippa. You want to say it. Dippa, whatever. It's yeah. not quite as you smooth as that. It. But I think it's a, it's a damn good beer. It's a dangerous beer. <laughs> but it's a highly drinkable beer. I think that's true for a lot of their beers, though. A lot of their it beers is. are dangerous. It is. Not my favorite. I think I still prefer the Heady Topper in this category. Uh, but that's... I mean, look, you are you get this high in the stratosphere of IPAs. You're playing with some oh. dangerous company. It's not my favorite d double IPA either, you're talking, but it's really good. Yeah, you, but you're talking about like sh like ugh, small shades, variations. Like It's hard to really rate things in here and once you get to this point, right? It's tough. It's tough. But I'm going to give it a 4.75 out of 5. Wow. Nice. Didn't expect that. Giving us a final score of 4.625. And I, I don't want to make it seem like... I don't know. I don't have a lot to, to knock about this beer. It just doesn't... I don't know. It's... Well, I gave it... I know, I know. 5. I know. It's a great beer. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I don't Dude, know... Dude, anything that. over 4 or 5 is good. Yes, it's a great it's a great beer. It's just not quite, you know, heady topper... For me, it's like, but it's, then again, it's just well, like, uh... It's not quite plenty for me either. It's just quite a shade underneath, that's all. Yeah. And I, I like you, think 
normally with double IPAs, I expect more piney resiny stuff to hang around a little longer. It's it, but so it's one of my knocks on it. Like I said, if it, if I wanted something that's not like that, but I want a double IPA quality beer, I think it's good for that. But I think at that when you get to that point, it's quibbling. It's like yeah, little, exactly. Little quibbles here or there. You know? It's like That's when all. we discuss the different Hawaiian islands and what sucks about each of them. Right. You're still talking about paradise across yes. the board. Except nothing sucks here. We're we're in such good we're in cl- <laughs> we're in cloud eighteen here. Right, yeah. Uh, that you know Well sucks is relative. Sucks That's, yes. Yeah. There's nothing sucks about this beer at all. <laughs> it's just you start to quibble and nitpick. Yeah. And that's tough. It's a lot easier when you have a terrible beer like the Rogue Lemon Cruller right. from <laughs> Yay so long ago. That's a fun one to do. Well, thanks for listening to Brew Bloods, episode 64. Thanks for all your support. If you want to help out the show, uh, well, first of all, listen to us. Subscribe to the show. It's easy to do. Just go to brewbloods.net, and there's links to the show. And uh, tell you, there's a, even a guide there. If you don't know how to subscribe to the podcast, it'll teach you how to do so. Mark does a step-by-step video. If you would uh, do us a favor, go to iTunes. And I'm nude the entire time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's only a Vimeo, because you can't have nudity on YouTube. <laughs> With his wiener in a beer the entire time. Oh, the, the wiener is the pointing device. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes. It would help us. doesn't help you, but it does help us. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, give us a nice, shiny five stars if you it like It helps us. you, because you get your opinion out there. True. Good point. You're you heard would, that way. If you would be so kind, check us out on all the social networks. Picks uh, are on Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even now, the Snopchotties. If you have any feedback on the show, you can email us at brewbloodsshow at gmail.com. Call us at 469-573-BEER. That's 469-573-2337. And we do another show called uh, Break Room. We brought it back once again. It's been zombified. It's alive. Somewhat. It's, yeah. It's a yeah. You can go to uh, breakroom.tv and find all the links to subscribe to that show there. Now it is considerably more NSFW, as the kids like to say. It's a little more adult. A little more scatological, but a little more loosey-goosey. Sure. Mommy's system, and there's so. a third guy there. And there's a third guy named Thomas the Tank who doesn't like yes. beer. So Exactly. So anyways, we'll catch you guys next week for episode 65 of Rue Bloods. For Dustin, I'm Mark. For Mark, I'm Dustin. Out, go out. Probst. Out, go out, gasoline, high five.